I was contacted by Jeffrey Beckham a couple months ago, and I know Jonathan was absolutely fabulous. And I thought, okay, this is the group that I want to come to. And so we consider the uh, we consider a museum a sacred secular space. Um, we, 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 that, I mean, that's that's what it is. It's a community space. We're we're about um, um, you know the, the the community more than we are. You know, the exhibitions are wonderful. But it's really about um, the group, you know, it's really about the community. And what uh, we're trying to do is start a thing called the Fabulous 3000. And it's going to be based on the bricks on the floor rather than the names on the wall. And it's, it's, it's an idea that um, most museums, it's, it's 10 big donors donors and they, they, they put all their money together and then they run the place. And we'd like to try it in a, in a little more broad-based way. And so, you know, I saw this, I saw, you know, at Harry Marks last month, I saw this is the part of the congregation that we want to build here. So, I mean, I'm welcoming all of you here if you haven't been here before. And you're at the beginning of a congregation. And we'd like you to, uh, you know, again, sign up your email on the way out and tell people about what we're doing here and uh, help us get involved because it, you know, like the science says, uh, no membership, no gin and tonic. It really is a uh, community responsibility to make this work. If the community doesn't respond, um, it won't work. And if the community does respond, it will work fabulously. Uh, we've had, I don't know, 22 shows in 18 months. We've had uh, some of the cream of the uh, of uh, the uh, peninsula in this building. Uh, Jeffrey shows up now. Peter's got work up now. Uh, the whale show is just first rate. And uh, we want to, to spread the word and we want your involvement. And the great Julianne. Thank you. The, the year of the mission series. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn this over. Thank you. Okay. This is our fourth, fifth year of Arts in Progress. Um, we have a lineup of really exciting presenters. Jeffrey Beckham will be here next month at Museum of Monterey. We're hoping that Huntington Witherell will be able to come here in April. After that, we might be back at the Oldermeyer Center, so just look at your emails carefully about location. Um, we will be allowed to go up to the Joe Mora exhibit after uh, Peter's talk. Um, and the only thing you need to know about that is no food or drink up there. Um, and now I will turn you over to Marty Manson, the president of Arts Habitat. Many of you already know me and you already know about Arts Habitat, so I'm going to keep this brief because after all you came to hear Peter Hiller talk about his life in the arts. But I'll just remind you that Arts Habitat will be a vibrant arts community at the East Garrison on the former Fort Ord in our lifetime. <laughs> and, uh, as usual, I'm hopeful and uh, still speaking to the developer on a regular basis, and work is proceeding out there, I'm happy to say. So welcome to uh, Arts in Progress, and especially welcome to Peter Hiller, who's going to talk to us about his life in the arts, and I'm sure that'll be um, inspiring for all of us. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. When Darcy asked me to do this, I immediately said yes, and then had no idea why I answered that way. Um, um, I do spend a good deal of my life talking and talking about, uh, talking with my students and then also talking about Joe Mora. But I never talk about myself. And for whatever reason, I just, um, so this put me in a very different um, light or my thinking had to change. And I had to sort of figure out why am I doing this. And what I, what I finally realized is that it was just a wonderful opportunity to tell my story. And everybody deserves a chance to tell their story. And so that's what I, you know, I wish you all this opportunity. Everybody's stories are different and everybody's stories are interesting. And it just happened to be that tonight is the time that I get to tell mine. So that's what I'm going to do. And um, as I was trying to craft um, my presentation, it fell into three categories. One was my work as a curator, the other was my work and life as a teacher, and 
the third one being my life as a creative person, um, an artist, if you will. And so what I'm going to do is, and in fact, I just made this decision about an hour ago, I was going to kind of go chronologically, and I decided, well, no, I'm going to go by category instead. So I'm going to tell three stories that parallel each other, but I'm going to tell them kind of based on subject matter. And I will start with the curator story. It's, in a way, the shortest. But, uh, the curator story started in about 1995. We had lived here since 1981. Slowly over that period of time, I began to become aware of the artwork of a man by the name of Joe Mora. Now, my guess is that that's a name that's familiar to most of you, but being a newbie up here in 1981, it was somebody that I wasn't aware of uh, until we started, we lived here for a little while. And I began to slowly see evidence of his work. And he is a multifaceted person. There's a lot of ephemeral material out in the world about that he was responsible for. And slowly but surely, I started to see evidence of that. Um, at school where I work, there were a couple of posters that a former teacher had um, stashed away. One was the cowboy, and in, the cowboy poster and then Joe's Indian poster, and those were very intriguing. I was at this trail and saddle club at a saddle gear exhibit many, many years ago. We found one of the menus from the Hotel Del Monte that had pirates on it. Well, that, was, that rang true to my children. They thought that was really cool. Um, so that was actually our first Gilmore purchase for $5 or something. <laughs> and, and slowly it began to build and build. And I, I got to a point where it was, I guess you might call it critical mass, where all of a sudden I realized this is a very interesting person. I am seeing a lot of evidence of his work. I'm seeing how broad his, his creative capacities were. And now I really want to find out more about him. So it was with that that, and here's where the chutzpah comes in, um, I went to Richard Gadd, who at the time was the director of the Monterey Museum of Art. I had known Richard for a number of years and had worked with him on a project uh, about Armin Hansen that I did as a teacher, and it, was, it, involved, um, it was an, involved an activity book that we put together um, that was then given to the museum, and the museum gave it to students who came to visit. So, I had a nice relationship with them. I went into Richard and I said, Richard, I think it would be appropriate and fascinating to do an exhibit of Joe Moore's work here at the Museum of Art. He didn't think about it very long and he said yes. So that was in about 1995, 1996. And that began about a two year um, period for me of curating this exhibit which opened in 1998, it ran for the summer of 1998. It broke attendance records, and it was to date the largest exhibit of Joe Moore's work that's ever been gathered together. Um, this was published um, in commemoration of the show, and it was, it was absolutely, for me, it was an amazing experience to, to put this all together. Now, at the same time, this is all happening in the 25, 26, 27, 28 hours of the day that um, are beyond the regular 24, because I'm teaching full-time during all of this at All Saints, and All Saints Day School in Carmel Valley, where since 1981, I have been the art teacher there. So, but I, the connection again is that I'm bringing my kids along for the ride. So I'm, as I'm learning to be what a curator does, because I absolutely walked in there cold, I had no idea, um, but I just figured it was probably a lot of hard work, and I was willing to do that. So I just started that process. I dragged my family all over the Southwest. We ended up going um, into museums. We got to go behind the scenes in museums to see their collections, all in the um, attempt to borrow things that were then going to become part of the show. So it was, it was curatorship by trial but it was an absolutely satisfying experience. I absolutely loved it. And so that, that show came down in 1998, and I've continued to have the opportunity to work with the Joe Moore's material. 
Now that came about because when I decided to do this exhibit and got the OK from Richard, I introduced myself to Joe Morris' son, who at the time was living in Pebble Beach and was uh, trying to retire, as he would tell me often. Uh, he lived to be 98 years old and lived a wonderful, wonderful life, but I, I didn't want to do any work without his OK. And I always kind of felt like I was carrying on the spirit of his work, uh, Joey's work, who really looked after his father's work and his father's interests um, throughout Joey's life. And so I always wanted to make sure anything I did, I had his blessing. So I introduced myself to him, became good friends. I would visit him periodically. We would have his special rum daiquiris together, um, only one because he made them very strong. And we became friends, and, and that established a relationship where any time I did another project and that I would check with him, just wanted to make sure it was all right with him and that he was comfortable with the idea, and then I would proceed. And he always said yes, which was just wonderful. And uh, everybody that I actually ended up ever asking to offer any help or assistance or loan it, have, with anything having to do with Joe Mora, always said yes. And I kind of attribute that to the spirit of Joe Mora. If people who have Joe Mora's work really enjoy it, they love him, and they've all been willing to share it. So that was, a, that was the first exhibit of many. I've continued to work with the material since then. That becomes the small community story that the peninsula is. It happened to be that the lawyers that took care of Joey were parents of students of mine. And when I found that out, I talked to them and they kind of watched what I was doing and they watched my relationship with Joey and it continued on that um, after I, I continued to do shows, I continued to look for exhibiting possibilities, for publishing possibilities, and um, just different things to get the word out about Joe Moore. I mean, that was kind of my you know, overall um, interest was that I found him so absolutely fascinating that I thought everybody ought to have an opportunity to see his work and get an idea if they thought he was as interesting as I did. And yeah, I always felt he was very underappreciated. Um, certainly more appreciated in this community than any place else, but, but even in this community, I'm constantly running into people who are not familiar with his work, and then it's a pleasure to be able to introduce um, them to his accomplishments. So I've continued to do that, and Joey passed away about four years ago, but the lawyers trusted me, they knew of my pre-existing relationship with Joey, and so they've allowed me to continue to do the work that I, the curatorial work that I have. And um, one bit of evidence of that is the exhibit that's upstairs. It was in its inception, Julianne and I were working together, putting together what was started as a, um, as a magazine article about Joe's time in California in 1903 when he rode the California Mission Trail. And so that's the story, that's the evidence of what you see upstairs. Uh, in this current exhibit, which coincides which for, with, uh, with a full year celebration of Father Sarah's 300th birthday coming up in November and a year of sort of celebrating the missions. So you are invited to go up there and, and after this talk I'll go up there as well. Okay. So that's sort of the curator story. Um, the teaching story began when I was in college. And it goes back, I was a student at a school called Johnston College. It was a small liberal arts school um, in Redlands, California. Shared some facilities with the University of Redlands. But it was really a school that came out of the 60s and the whole kind of anti-school sentiment, the alternative school programs, schools like Antioch and Goddard and places that were kind of with the theme based on Summer Hill and things, and, and it happened to be, it was an absolute blessing that I discovered this school. I'm sure I wouldn't have made it through college if I hadn't found this school. It's, um, there were no grades, um, there, were no, there were no requirements as far as classes were concerned. You established your own graduation requirements for yourself. The, the grading was all done by written evaluation, and which was a huge amount of work. 
uh, on the part of the faculty, but they were willing to do it because they all believed in, in that whole idea. Well, so I'm, and it, there was an amazing amount of flexibility. And in fact, I got to a point after about three years where I was really, even then, I was just kind of just done with school. And, but then we figured out a way that if I worked for a semester, one more semester in the summer, I could graduate early. And so I did it, just to be done with it. And, but at the same time, I had the opportunity to teach photography. And so I, uh, and again, here's where chutzpah fits into this whole thing. I have, was taking classes across the street at the University of Redlands. I was involved with their ceramics department. They were talking about starting a photography program and a photography, at least a photography class to begin with. And I just sort of raised my hand in this, you know, junior in college and said, I'll do it. And they said, okay. So I ended up teaching photography while I was still a student. And I was teaching it to college students and also adult community uh, students as well. And I absolutely loved it. But I didn't really know I loved it at the time. But I enjoyed it, I, and it was pretty serious. They took it pretty seriously. They actually evaluated me and observed my work, and so it wasn't just this you know, fly-by-night deal. But I had had such a wonderful photography teacher while I was in high school, and I had learned so much from that experience that I was able to carry that forward and to teach design and then to teach this class. And it, so it, it was just a wonderful experience. Well, that came to an end when I graduated, and I didn't graduate with really a sense of where I was going. So we ended up moving, my wife graduated at the same time, and she had all these teaching credentials, she knew exactly what she was doing. And we moved to Santa Monica at the time, and I worked in a liquor store, and I trimmed trees for the city of Los Angeles under the CETA program, which was more money than I'd ever seen as far as the paycheck was concerned. And then somewhere along the line, it just sort of sunk in, and that part of it had to do with watching my wife who was teaching, and I just said, well, you know what? I had really actually enjoyed that experience of teaching photography. And so I just thought, okay, well, I'm not gonna fall into that kind of situation again, most likely, so I needed to take it seriously, and I went back to school to UCLA for a year. Their teaching program was, their teacher credential program was designed in such a way that you could choose seven different approaches to seven different methodologies towards the same end and the same material. And of course, I chose the hippie version and the one that was the loosey goosey one, but it ended up being perfect for me and um, it, was, it was a wonderful experience. I did my student teaching in Beverly Hills, made great friends with uh, Dr. Joan Alamond who ran the Beverly Hills School District Art Department for many, many years. Uh, she became sort of a mentor for me and it was just, it was a wonderful experience um, getting my credential. And then I was really lucky to walk right into a job. So I found a job at a school called Clearview, which was a special education program. I didn't know that at the time. And, and they didn't tell me at the time. It was somehow it was not part of the interview process. I don't, I don't know why, but it was all the same to me. So I mean, I had a job and um, it, was the, it was convenient enough. And it was, it was teaching art, which is what I wanted to do. And I've been teaching ever since. That was in about 1978 or so that that started. And so we lived, we stayed in um, Los Angeles. We kind of got ants in our pants, decided we had had enough of Southern California and Los Angeles. And so we spent some time looking around and through the good fortune of um, friends who were already living up here, we, I found out about the job at All Saints. And it was actually hired just to teach a summer class and summer art class in 1981. And at the same time that I took that job and started teaching that job, the, during the summer, the art job during the school year opened up as well. And so I kind of already had my foot in the door a little bit. And they said, well, do you think you could do that? And would that be of interest? And I said, absolutely, yes. And because we both really wanted to move and to come up here. And so we did that in 1981. And we've been at All Saints ever since. So I've been teaching 
art um, to the students in first through eighth grade. I have a former student here tonight. Um, I am now teaching, yes, who is a teacher uh, now as well. Uh, I'm now teaching the children of my students, um, at least, and I, I don't think we've gone to grandchildren yet, but <laughs> that's next. Uh, so. And what's happened is that, and those of us in that business who've been doing it for a long time, is it just creates a world. And you end up living in this community. And we were at an event the other night, and we couldn't even get a third of the way through the event because of all the people we saw and knew. And again, over years and years of, you figure 25 families every year, new families, and it just kind of grows exponentially over the course of, um, of living here. And so it's just a wonderful feeling. It's a wonderful experience to be here and to live in this community and to know so many people and, and to you know, just feel comfortable here. And I don't ever feel like I'm a native son because I wasn't born here and I wasn't even born in California, goodness. Uh, I was born in Illinois, and, but only lived there for two years. But um, 59 years later, I've been in California, but still I have to qualify it. You know, you just, you got to be born here to be able to say you were, really grew up here. So, so, uh, so that's the, the teaching. And uh, along the way, I've done um, some writing uh, for a magazine called Arts and Activities. Uh, which is designed for grade school teachers. Uh, I have taught through the Chapman program. I taught a teacher training program uh, through them a few years ago, which I really enjoyed. It felt like a really nice way to be giving back. Uh, and, and then again, just uh, it's just daily kind of interesting and crazy. I'm, I'm thinking that I'm probably the only person in the room tonight who at about 4.30 was holding a fan above the heads of students who were dressed as characters in Peter Pan as we were filming them for the flying scene um, to be part of our spring musical next at the end of the month. So am I right? Am I the only one that was doing that today? So, that's awesome. so it kind of goes with the territory. You just never know what to expect, uh, but it is, um, it's interesting and, um, and always, you know, something new around the corner. You never know. So. So that's kind of the, I think that's the teaching story. And then what's left is the art story. And what I, what I did tonight was I brought artifacts. And I've, if you can't see things when I hold them up, I invite you to come look at them afterwards. Um, I just have in kind of this anti-PowerPoint mode right now. And <laughs> so, um, so that's, that con con consequently, I decided to go old school here and to bring the actual material. So the, the last stream of the three that I propose to talk about tonight is my artwork. And I think that maybe goes back to third grade. And Mrs. Larson, who taught me about Vincent Van Gogh. And I knew we had a book on a shelf at our house um, called Lust for Life by Irving Stone. And I, for some reason, had looked through it and knew that it had to do with Vincent Van Gogh. So I thought, this is amazing connection. I mean, my teacher's telling me about this guy. We have a book about this guy, you know, and stuff. Um, and so th that's one of my earliest memories, just about what art was all about. I grew up in what I would call an artful family. No, not necessarily artists, but an artful family. And my grandparents were very interested in art on both sides of the family. My parents, consequently, were they all had a sensitivity to what we would call modern art now. And so I, and also um, ethnic art. I grew up with um, Hopi and Kachina material in our house. That was an interest that both my parents shared. And so it was, it was, um, it, it was just kind of all around me. And my father was, um, was a, he was a theatrical agent. So his, his artistic bent didn't ever have anything to do with his career particularly, but he was constantly taking photographs. And I, I, I feel very strongly that that interest of his rubbed off on me. Back in the days when I was um, probably still in high school, thinking that I wanted to be a professional photographer, for some reason I thought maybe people would be interested in having their dogs and cats photographed. <laughs> so, 
So I made a little flyer and you know, did the little tabs at the bottom with the phone numbers on it and put it up at the local pet shop and I never got any calls for it. But, um, but I was still, I was taking pictures. I was taking pictures from the time I was a little kid and I kind of put this book together as a portfolio and, and it goes back to with kind of throughout a lot of my youth and uh, my youth and then high school and then into um, college as well. So it's just an example of a lot of different photographs that I took, a lot of interest um, in, in just different, you know, visual images. Um, I traveled to North Africa in 1970, I think it was, and took pictures there. It was really the only thing I had with me when I got home was my camera. I'd kind of given away everything else or traded it. Um, but this goes back pretty much throughout my career. And I brought this as an example of, I think, uh, a piece that I did, but that was really influenced by my dad. And again, he, he took pictures of us. I have a brother and two sisters. He was photographing us all the time. He did a lot of work with, um, with different shutter speeds and blurring motion and um, creating different kinds of effects. And th this is a piece that I did, but it's, I think, in 1969. But I, I, it, it was very influenced by the work that my dad did. And so I've, um, it's actually hanging flowers at the Bouchard Gardens in, um, on Vancouver Island, but, or Victoria, in, Victor in Victoria on Vancouver Island. And so that was, um, that was just, I mean, he really kind of sunk in. And then I had this wonderful opportunity to take photography in high school. And the, this, Arnold Rubinoff was my teacher. This was at Uni High in um, West Los Angeles after I stopped going to Pally High, and I won't go into that story. <laughs> so, so, um, but, um, but he was just a great photography teacher. And I learned a tremendous amount of material from him, including my first exposure to Ansel Adams. Mm -hmm. So this is back also in the late 60s. I had the opportunity to hear Ansel talk at UCLA, you know, lectured and just instantly fell in love with his work. Was fortunate to meet him and to hang out a couple of times with him in later years. But that was, um, it really was how I was kind of grounded in photography was through my high school classes, and that's the, that's the background that gave me the gumption to say I could teach photography um, while I was in college. So at the same time, or actually a little before that, um, I grew up, again, this is in West Los Angeles, and we used to go on Saturdays, my mom, my dad, my sister's brother, we'd be invited over to, the, um, to a home near, to go swimming. We didn't have a swimming pool, the neighbors did have a swimming pool. And so we would, you know, on Saturdays or Sundays, if it was foggy at the beach, we would go um, to their house to go swimming. Well, everybody would have a great time in the swimming pool, but I would go in the house because they had a collection of Natzler pottery, Otto and Gertrude Natzler. And I was just a total nerd for this pottery. And I don't know if you're familiar with their work or not, but. Um, you can certainly, you know, look through this book, but they, the Sperrys, who are the family, had just had this spectacular collection of Natzler pottery. And I would sit there inside while everybody else was out swimming, and I would just stare at this pottery. It had such an incredible um, textural components to it. The colors were amazing. The forms were just so striking to me. And I mean, and this is, I'm an eight-year-old kid, you know, at, at this point, looking at this pottery. And I was just mesmerized by it. Well, lo and behold, my grandparents both passed away. Um, this was on my mom's side. And we were going through their effects. And I opened up a cupboard. This was, they lived in Chicago. I opened up a cupboard that, you know, nobody had gotten to yet. And it was like the light just blasted out of this cupboard. And I, what I saw was this, and I immediately knew it was a Natzler bowl. I mean, and again, I'm not, now maybe I'm 11. Um, but I saw this and I knew, I just, I, I lost my breath. I mean, I just looked at this and I said, my God, I said, that's a real Natzler bowl. Can I have it? You know, it was, uh, so it's the one thing that I got. Um, it's the only thing I cared about. 
but it was just, um, it was so just, I was just dumbfounded. And, and it, the sad thing was I, I couldn't ask him about it. Um, I came to find out that there were, you know, a number of people in Chicago that, you know, the Natzlers had connected with and that had Natzler co collections. Um, the Art Institute has a really nice Natzler uh, collection as well. But this, is, this was just like this prized piece, and I've had the privilege of um, taking care of it uh, ever since I discovered it. And I, I used to go back and visit my grandparents all the time, so it wasn't like I was a stranger to their house. I'd been there many, many times, but I just never knew until that moment that they had this piece of pottery. So that was, um, that was a dream come true. So then we flash forward to Santa Monica, and we're living in Santa Monica, and we have this SX-70 camera, not this one, but one like it. And it, um, it's on our dining room table, and accidentally it gets knocked off the table. And it ends up on the, on the ground, and it breaks, sort of. Now, having said that, before it broke, I was using it to take pictures of instant items, like instant mashed potatoes. And I would walk through the market and I would take pictures with the instant camera of instant items. I thought that was pretty interesting. <laughs> you know, so, 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 so a little conceptual art going on here. So, uh, but what happened when it, when it got knocked off the counter is that the rollers that are inside here that spread the emulsion through the picture were knocked out of alignment. And so what happened was that it just, it, and this is actually two different images, but it's, it just dragged the, the chemicals across the surface or in between the surface planes and made color. Well, that was kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. So then I started doing that intentionally. I mean, I would buy roll or package after package of film, was shooting them through the camera. They were all coming out um, with these kinds of designs. I started putting together the designs so that we, here's two. Imagine about 16 of them um, mounted together so that it makes these kind of ropes or braids, different things. And what this did was, you know, th this is around the time that I have, I've graduated from college. We're in Santa Monica now. I'm probably working for the city and it's before I've got my teaching credential. But I'm, I found myself in a period where I was for the first time kind of had the time to really pursue my artwork. And it wasn't the first time I'd done that because I'd had an exhibit while I was in college still. Uh, my favorite story with that was a landscape that I did, and th this was part of my graduation requirement that I superimposed on myself. But uh, I took, a f it was a landscape picture and somebody at the exhibit saw it and said they wanted to buy it, and I think it was $10 or something. And I said, well, that's, I was flattered and said, well, certainly, and they said, you know why? He said, because do you see that face in the clouds there? So, and I said, I had no idea there was a face in the clouds. <laughs> you know, but it was, it was a very interesting experience just for the first time having that kind of interaction with somebody and, and realizing people see what they will see and uh, whether it's what you intended or not. But, but so this, was, this, this is 1978, so it is right around that time. And then all kinds of, you know, I, all kinds of different things started happening with it. And I started, I just was going through film. I eventually stopped even, and this is an example, I stopped even using the camera. And I would just buy the film and take the whole film container apart and then get rolling pins and roll the emulsion myself. And so that was doing, that was doing things like this. So you can see it changed. And then I started making collages out of them. And this is where I felt like it finally got to be something that was really aesthetically pleasing, completely aesthetically pleasing to me. Um, and in fact, had, the, had a show at the Bruised Reed Gallery um, right up the street. Uh, do you remember the Bruised Reed Gallery? Yeah, yeah. And it was, this was right before we actually moved here, but I was thrilled to have this exhibit. And I was really pleased with the way the work was developing and it was, it was the first and most genuine period that I've ever had as far as time to, make, time to see a process evolve. 
And as you can see, I mean, one thing led to another and then to another. And I just loved that experience. And that experience has stayed with me, um, even though I haven't had the time really to devote to it like I did at this point, where I was, because um, then work and reality and you know, that kind of thing started to interfere, but not in a bad way, but it just interfered with that one sort of period where I had an obst obstructed time to work and, and to see my work develop and evolve. So it was really, it was a rich period. And now what's happened since then is that I've, um, I feel like my work is inspiration based. And so if an idea comes to me, uh, I can make the time, I will make the time to sort of see that idea through um, to, its, to a satisfactory point. Um, and that's worked fine because it's been, a, it's been a good way to juggle my own work and teaching uh, full-time and doing the Joe Mora work and stuff. So it, it's, it's fit and it's worked really well. So there's, uh, and then there's another parallel. Well, so let's see. So, oh, okay, so, so you have a sense that I was interested in the ceramics. It was, you know, when I discovered the Natzler work, I knew I wanted to try working on a wheel, but I could never figure it out, never make the time to do it in high school. I finally got to do it in college and had met a fantastic um, teacher. His name is Leon Moberg. He still lives down in uh, the Redlands area. This is a piece that he did, and he was about to throw it away because the rib stuck in the piece while he was trimming it, and I saw it. I said, oh, no, 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 that's beautiful. That's fantastic. I love that, and so um, he glazed that, and I got to keep it, and it was, um, and then, so this is his work, where you can see we use the same glaze, so this is a piece that I did um, around the same time. My favorite part of the glaze is that it's uh, based on with uranium, and I don't know how he ended up with raw uranium, but um, he did, and we're all still walking and talking, so I guess it, I mean I guess it was okay. Um, but and, and then this is another piece from that same period while I was in college, um, just to give you a sense that I wasn't just emulating his work, um, but doing my own work as well. So I started working with clay when I got to college, and fortunately, because we have a ceramics room at All Saints, I've been able to keep working with clay, because um, I, I just have that availability of the facility and stuff. And so I've done, here's another couple of pieces. This is um, painted, it's a painted surface. On a clay, I was, became intrigued with, um, with the idea of a different kind of a surface. This was at a period right before we moved up here um, in a, of a house I grew up in, just the architectural detail of it. Another example from the house that we're living in now. So I just became intrigued with the different kind of a surface than one would ordinarily paint or draw on. And then, so those are kind of old. Then, a few years ago, still working, let's see, how do I hold these? Um, again, with the clay surfaces, but then this is painted with acrylic um, paint instead of glaze. And it, this was a series I did that I felt like I was paying uh, homage to people whose influences um, had been important to me. Um, other artists and things, and so that was from a that was actually on display at the Cherry Center. And then I still I go dumpster diving, and this you can't imagine the material that gets thrown away um, <laughs> in Sand City. But this is a small example of piece that I started um, collecting stuff out of the dumpster f of marble and granite, and then putting it together. And they took all kinds of different shapes and forms, but um, that was a sculptural piece. And what I would do when I was, again, this is an example of a series. Um, I couldn't wait to get home and after work, and I would just you know, go around the side of the house and start gluing stuff together um, so, until I finally kind of ran out of gas. This is a book by Carrie McWilliams that we, both my wife and I, read when we were living in Los Angeles. And in a way, I'd say it changed my life because it's just, it's a wonderful expose about California. 
it's called Island in the Land, Island on the Land, Southern California. And he, he I mean, Carrie McWilliams is an amazing, interesting person anyways, but this book just kind of goes through all different aspects of Southern California, the agriculture, the film business, the arts, and uh, it was just a, a wonderful source of a lot of information. It got us interested in reading about, uh, reading fiction based in Hollywood and Southern California, Raymond Chandler and John Fonte, um, people like that, and Mary Austin actually as well. So then we ended up with one of my favorite birthday presents ever when um, my wife found a copy of uh, Mary Austin's book that was photographed, illustrated by Ansel Adams, and she even asked Ansel to autograph it to me, so he did that. Uh, and then what I started doing was putting together images with quotes from these books. And in some cases, they were postcards that I found. In other cases, they were um, photographs that I took myself. And then I would pick the quotes out of the books that, you know, in most cases, the quotes came before the image. Um, and then what I did, I actually, in fact, Iris and Reed probably have examples of this and Celeste here. Um, I passed these around a faculty meeting once because I wanted the writing, which are the quotes, to be in different people's handwriting, not just mine. So at a faculty meeting, I passed these around in the, the backs of postcards, and then just different people just sort of filled in the quotes for me. I have um, a propensity towards wide open spaces, and I first discovered that in North Africa, and you know, living here, you have that sense but I love the desert in the southwest. Then I ended up um, wanting to see the sand hills of Nebraska. Now again, I'm willing to bet I'm the only person that's intentionally gone on vacation to the sand hills in Nebraska. Um, but, uh, <laughs> um, but before we went, I wanted to read something that was pertinent to the area. So I found this uh, Marie Sandoz book about old Jules, who was a pioneer in that area read that and then put together a number of the photographs that I took while we were there with quotes um, that corresponded to the, to the images. And so this was a series that I did, um, again, with that same theme. So it's kind of interesting to see how these themes continue. They, they don't die away. They just kind of, you know, sometimes they ferment and then they come back to life again. So from that book to, to this. One of the projects that I'm most pleased and happy about that I attribute to Joe Mora was being the person who took the time to fill out the application to have the Monterey County Courthouse put on the National Register of Historic Places. And I um, treated myself to a copy of this photograph of the courthouse, but while the new building was finished and the old building still existed inside, right in the courtyard area, and so that was something that totally came about just because of my work with Joe Mora. It was discovering that the courthouse was not on the register and that it's a public process. I mean, I didn't have to ask anybody. I just did it and, and it worked. So now it is on the, um, on the register. Why do you take the photograph? Um, I don't. Um, I got the photograph from Neil Hotel in, but I don't know. So it's in the Pebble Beach archives. Do you know what year it is? It was 1936-ish. I think it was right, right before they um, took it apart. I mean, the fascinating thing was Robert Stanton was the architect, and I'm sure you've seen the building, but all the architectural adornments are Joe Morris' work. But Robert Stanton was the architect. Well, he, they couldn't close the courthouse during construction. So the whole design of the building had to be fashioned in such a way that the original building could continue to be in operation while they built the new building around it. And they literally, when they finished construction of the new building, it was designed in such a way that they took the furniture out of the windows of the old building and handed them through to the windows on the new building and court stayed in action you know, throughout the whole thing. Um, so, and then they took the old building apart, board by board, and carried it out um, through the columns that there um, surround the building. 
writing. And this kind of goes back to my dad as well. He went to Carleton College. He was a writer while he was in the Army to a certain extent, but he also was an engineer working on the Bailey Bridges. But he kept writing and throughout his life, I'm not seriously in terms of for publication or anything like that, but it's the one thing that he never saw me accomplish while he was alive um, was anything quote unquote published, but it's been something that I've just taken to and, and just in love doing, part, partly because the subject matter, which usually is about Joe Mora, is fascinating and fun to write about, but I also have written for art magazines and it's just, it's something that I really enjoy doing. This is a book that the Book Club of California asked me to write. It's a monograph about Joe Moore. Actually, they only, they didn't ask me. They said yes when I proposed it to them. Um, but it's just a little piece about Joe Mora um, and a lot of his California-themed work where I was responsible for the text and as we put these together and then the biography that starts it. The Book Club of California is based in San Francisco. They're on Sutter Street in San Francisco. And they have embraced uh, small press publications since their inception, I think. They've always supported publication by small presses. They publish at least one piece every year. This is, this is a piece that they call a keepsake. That's something that comes with membership. Um, and what else would you fill in? This is the 100, 100 years. years. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So they're really unique in the country, and they focus on California. OK, but yeah, it's yeah. Very, I mean, this is a huge feather in your cap. Oh, yeah, well, I was thrilled. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and uh, here's what I did is I buried this. Another publishing coup, and this goes back to again to Joe Mora, obviously, but there are so many wonderful chapters in Joe Mora's life. And it, so far I've only been able to deal with them kind of chapter by chapter because the entire span of his career is just overwhelming. The coffee table book would just be too heavy to carry. So I haven't gotten to that point yet, but I've been able to chip away chapter by chapter. And this is the story of a trip that he took beginning in San Jose and then he ended up in Arizona, where he lived for three and a half years with the Hopi and the Navajo. And this is the story of his, the first part of that journey from San Jose to Yosemite, where he spent a couple of weeks. And this is, a, um, I, what's so amazing about the family, and I've, I've said this before, but somehow the Mora family knew to keep everything. And it's the same way that, um, uh, Roy Rogers' family kept everything. How'd they know when he was a little kid that he was going to be famous? Uh, but the Morris kept letters, they kept photographs that Joe did, they kept artwork, and consequently there's this wonderful resource that we have in the archives that's available for quote-unquote research. Well this is, this story really, besides, I just wrote the foreword, but it is the story of that trip and it's in Joe's own words. It's his journal that he kept on a daily basis um, during that trip in 1904 um, from San Jose through Yosemite. And it also shows the artwork that he did while he was on this trip. And it's, um, almost every day starts out with woke up, but usually about 4.30. Um, got up, got fire going, co <coughs> cocoa, fed the mules. You know, that almost every day started that way. Co cocoa was his main staple. But what, what I love about this story is that it was a chapter I really wanted to tell I knew I had all the primary source material, but I never quite brought myself to decide, okay, you know, I'm, am I going to ask the trust to pay for it or not? You know, how, you know, how am I going to do this? And then a wonderful sort of serendipitous situation took place with some people up in the gold country who were fans of Joe Mora. They actually came to me and said, we would like to do an exhibit of Joe Mora's work would you be willing to participate by loaning material, things like that? And I said, of course. Um, I always say yes, and I'm just a pushover. So th they said that, and then I said, but I said, but you know what, if, this is, if you're serious about this, and this is gonna be a significant exhibit, then let's, um, would you consider publishing the story that coincides kind of with that geography and with that area? 
And they thought about it, and what was so amazing um, was that they, the, this is the Central Sierra Arts Council, they raised the money to publish the book by asking donors to participate in supporting that publication. Then consequently, and I, went, I did the work of getting the book published, and it, which included another story that I will be remiss if I don't touch on at least. And so we published the, the book in three different versions. This was the paperback version. This was the fancy hardback edition that came with a commemorative poster. And then there was a third one in the middle between, it was hardback, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't quite as fancy as that. But what happened was they raised the money to publish it, and then I was able to make sure that all the proceeds from the sales of the book went to the Arts Council. So it turned out to be a wonderful fundraising event for them, the sale of the books, and what I got to do was to see the book published and, um, and have a couple of copies of it. But that's what was just, it was so wonderful. It also, so it was, it was just kind of, I felt like it was a wonderful kind of, the trust isn't a nonprofit, but it was a way that the trust was able to help support a nonprofit organization, and so it felt really good. Um, the other thing that happened was that I met um, Arnold Martinez, who is the man who bound these books. And that was, I actually met him as a result of the um, book club publication because he did these, he made these slip cases. And he works out of this little, I don't know, it's not a warehouse because that implies that it's big, but just this little kind of garagey industrial space in South San Francisco. And he is a pure old school artisan, making all kinds of things out of leather, out of paper. He binds books, he makes things like these slip cases. Uh, he's just, it was just, it was, it brought me back to my days in junior high school in print shop, which is still one of my favorite smells in the world is printer's ink. And I absolutely loved it. And this was in that same spirit is that um, Arnold just was, you know, he became a fascinating uh, person and a friend. Um, I ended up actually writing an article about him for the book club just because I wanted the rest of the world to know, at least some more people to know about him than, than already did. And now what's kind of neat is he, he was, he's fairly long in age and it wasn't clear kind of what was going to happen. It felt like we were losing, you know, one of these historic artisans who do everything by hand. But um, the last time I talked to him, he said his son-in-law is becoming into this, the child of his, um, who was it, his nephew, his nephew is interested in the business and is starting, I think, to learn all the different um, components of it stuff. So I think, I hope that that will live on. And then last but not least are just some recent photographic pieces and I'll uh, just introduce them and leave them up here. But um, I went to a conference 2011 in Bakersfield so this is from the blacktop to Bakersfield. Um, it happened to be a spectacular day driving over there from here. And so even the oil fields were pretty cool. <laughs> and so that was, that's a fairly recent piece. Um, about a year and a half ago or two years ago, we saw some decomposing mushrooms in Golden Gate Park. That started a whole series of photographs of for the, throughout that winter of decomposing mushrooms. And most, all the rest of them were from around here. It was a really particularly good year for decomposing mushrooms. Uh, so that's, uh, that was another recent piece. And then the last one is um, a tribute to old cars. Uh, during the week of the concours, the, for the last couple of years, there's been an alternative and parallel event in Seaside. Uh, called the Concours de Limons, <laughs> and it is the, the Limons. The only qualification is that the car has to get to the exhibit, the display, on its own volition. You can't tow it in. But these are absolute, the purest sense of jalopies um, that you could ever imagine. And they just, they take it, I mean, that's the interesting thing. The people that are there, take it as seriously as the people in Pebble Beach that are looking at the other cars. But what I did was I started, and this is the image that was on the publicity is in one of these two books. But I went there two years in a row and just looking at the, at the rust and the color and, um, and things like that on these old cars. And 
Um, so this is, and what, kind of as I was putting this exhibit together, what I was, um, what I was struck by was, you know, from this to this, um, you know, in not that many years stuff. But, um, so there's a book from two years ago, and then there's another book from last year up here as well. And that's probably where I should stop. So, <laughs> so, so, so. Yes? Okay, you're not. You wet our appetite. We want to so. know about Palisades Holly. Nope. <laughs> <That's a>, no. <laughs> say what was um, uh, was a kind of a well it was a turning point and it was uh, I will also I could tell you on Saturday too when my wife's not here but uh, <laughs> so, so uh, I got in trouble let's just put it that way I got in trouble as uh, others of us did in the 60s and um, the best thing that ever happened was that they wouldn't let me go back to that school they sent me to the school next door and it was the best thing that ever happened to me because it, it was a sort of a forced change of life and um, I was able to turn things around and make new friends and um, stop doing the things I shouldn't have been doing. So, 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 but, uh, so. Thank you very much. So, oh, wait, I see another hand up. Yeah. Um, I've been asked to put this question to you by the local history folks at Commonwealth Library at Nassau Memorial. Mm -hmm. They just discovered that Joe Moore did the original designs for Harrison Memorial. Really? They were rejected by, the story they've got, mm -hmm. they were rejected by Mrs. Harrison in favor of the neighbor. Um. I, I know that story, and you're right. And apparently yeah. she didn't tell you about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm wondering if the family, the Mora family or the Mora archives have his designs, because they don't have them in their archives. You know, I, what, I, what is ringing a bell for me is him writing about that and how, you know, in fact, it was an, I think it was an article in the Pinecone. I mean, we we're talking back in the 30s or 40s. But he, w he was very angry about the way that whole thing evolved. And he wrote a pretty long piece that was published in the Pinecone. I don't know that I've seen anything else about that. But I, I mean, I think it does go along with what you're saying that, you know, for whatever reason, some, you know, they got far enough along in the process and then all of a sudden um, started, you know, back in heads and it didn't happen. Um, but th there was a history there. So I, um, I do know that that's true. I, don't, I haven't seen any visuals, so I don't know. But I mean, and Joe has a history of doing architectural work here in this area. So I, I know that was something he felt comfortable doing. And again, he got a little pretty far along in the process. And then all of a sudden, for whatever reason, it fell apart. And, um, I think they came up with the pine cone article. Was that doing a lot Oh, that could be. Yeah, yeah, that could be. But they can't find any other information. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's all that I've found as well. But, so most of the things in his collection in the family archives are pretty positive. Um, so I'm, that might be something they didn't want to keep <laughs> or yeah. something. It's interesting yeah. that he, he did at least get angry and yeah. whether he made any headway with the rich ladies of Como, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not in that case. I mean, he did with other people, but, um, but not in that case because so, there's, uh, in fact, Via Magazine that just came to our house yesterday has a paragraph. It's got a full page story about Carmel and the lead item. It's like 10 things to see in Carmel. The lead number one is to see Joe Moore's sculpture in the El Paseo courtyard. So I thought that was very cool. Yeah. So. Yeah. 